welcome to Fellowship Congregational United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming faith community dedicated to growing in spirit and working for justice. If this is your first time here or you've been here for years, we want to say welcome to church and to the final part of our six-week sermon series, Just Us, based on the children's book, Corey and the Seventh Story by Brian McLaren and Gareth Higgins. It's all about the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories that we are told about how the world works and what is possible. A couple of announcements before we begin worship uh, this afternoon. We will host an ordination service for our own Tracy Megley, who's here somewhere. There's Tracy in the back. Yes. Yes. who is a chaplain at Hillcrest Hospital. You are all welcome to attend that, even if you just want to see what an ordination service looks like in the United Church of Christ. Um, You are all instructed, of course, to bring live chickens. It's a very, (laughs) very crucial part of the service. It will begin at... Don't bring live chickens. Uh, It will begin at 3 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Also, Lent starts this week, uh, beginning with, I've never heard, I haven't heard anybody cheer that Lent is starting, but okay, uh, beginning with Ash Wednesday Options. Uh, option one is a come and go event at noon here in the sanctuary with some time for individual prayer and the imposition of ashes. So very come and go uh, on your lunch hour if you want to stop by and participate in that. Uh, The 6 p.m. service will contain a short liturgy and the imposition of ashes. Um, Now, if this uh, Ash Wednesday Lent thing is new to you, uh, there is a short video available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. It was sent out to you uh, via the newsletter if you subscribe to that, which is the best way to keep up with all of the goings-on here in the church, and you can sign up for that online at ucctulsa.org or in the sheet in the narthex. Friends, let us begin our worship service as we always do with the passing of the peace, which goes like this. Peace be with you. Can we take a moment and pass that peace along to those sitting around us? So as we find our way back to our seats, I will encourage us to cast our eyes screenward as we join together in the call to worship. Come together now to be in the presence of God who calls us to welcome the stranger and befriend the broken. In God's beloved community, no one is alone, not widows or orphans, Not immigrants, not the queer, the wounded, or the prisoner. No one is alone, for God has created us together. Speak to us in our time together, Holy One, and call us back to each other. Let our worship be our guide. Amen. The kids are coming forward now for the last edition We're going to complete the book this morning-ish. We're going to complete-ish the book this morning? Okay. We're getting close. Come, come, come. Whoa. 
Jennifer brought her own book today. I love it. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, dude. It is our last Sunday reading this book together this week. We've come a long way. We're going to almost finish the book. By almost, I mean, we're going to get back. I am going to read three pages today. I did set you up for that. This is the most we've read in one Sunday yet. Um, before we read those three pages, do you remember who was here last week? What happened in our story last week? Go ahead, Bryn. When they came back, everyone was in these great clothes because they, right. they didn't want to get like, offended. Or like yeah, when they came back, they found everybody in these gray cloaks looking the same. What did you want to add, Freya? And then, and then someone asked um, another person why they were wearing cloaks and turned, and they were just hiding some stuff that were different. That's right. They were wearing the gray cloaks so that they wouldn't, nobody would see what was different about them. Y'all did good. Remember it. I love it. So we're gonna add three pages to this the last part of our story. So here we go. That's when Badger remembered something. He remembered how happy he was when he first stole the the shiny object from Fox. He went to talk to her. We could make everyone happy, he said, if we sold everyone shiny objects. And we could get very rich too. So Badger and Fox built a shiny object factory. Soon everybody in the old village was buying shiny objects. They wore shiny objects as jewelry. They played with shiny objects as toys. They put shiny objects on their houses and used them to decorate their baggy gray coats. Who has the most shiny objects, Mouse asked. Who has the biggest shiny object, Deer wondered. Who has the most money from making and selling shiny objects to everyone, Fox and Badger asked, laughing, because they knew the answer. After that, Corey heard neighbors telling shiny object stories everywhere. Oh no, can you put it back on? Just a few more shiny objects, they said, and we will live happily ever after. Corey wanted to believe them, but looking around, Corey didn't feel happy. Badger and Fox cut down many beautiful trees to burn as fuel for their shiny object factory. The smokestacks filled the air with smelly gray smoke. The shiny object factory dumped dirty water onto the ground, and it flowed into the clear stream where the fish and tadpoles lived. Whenever there was a sport event or a concert, someone would interrupt with annoying shiny object commercials. (laughs) Remember that. And ugly, shiny objects, big sale signs, were popping up everywhere. Corey walked alone to the clear stream to sit by the water and think. We are in trouble, Corey thought. Our stories are failing us. No one will live happily ever after in a world like this. Owl flew over to perch in a nearby tree. They didn't say a word as they watched the water flow by and listened to its gentle music. We're going to stop there. We're going to talk about this. There's still half of this book left. But the other half of this story is the one that we talk about a lot in this church, and we're going to talk about that some more. So we're going to head over. Ready? Kids are uh, eventually headed off to Children's Church across the way, and you all are getting the uh, the clear signal that you're going to have to buy this book to finish the rest of it, you adults, <laughs> or go out to Children's Church, I suppose.
Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus has been debating with Pharisees and, uh, and talking with the crowd. And someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said to him, Man, who appointed me as judge or referee between you and your brother? Then Jesus said to them, Watch out. Guard yourself against all kinds of greed. After all, one's life isn't determined by one's possessions, even when someone is very wealthy. And then he told them a parable. A certain rich man's land provided a bountiful crop. He said to himself, what will I do? I have no place to store my harvest. Then he thought, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's where I'll store all of my grains and goods. And I'll say to myself, you have stored up plenty of goods, enough for several years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God will say to him, fool, tonight you will die. Now who will get the things you have prepared for yourself? This is the way it will be for those who hoard things for themselves and aren't rich with God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, or what you will wear. There's more to life than food, and more to the body than clothing. These are the words of our tradition. God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Thanks be to you, O God. Christianity that the majority of us have known all of our lives uh, is this distinctly American one, saturated in politics and patriotism and the long arm of capitalism, a supposedly free market that is idolized like a golden calf. If it were truly an open marketplace, free trade and barter, that would be one thing, but we all know that's not true. Greed drives the economic model we have with the assumption that whatever makes money is good and those who make money are protected and rewarded and enriched further and further. Adam Smith, the Scottish economist most commonly associated with the origins of capitalism, did promote a free market, low taxation, all of the things that we often hear from the proponents of capitalism. However, and this is a pretty big however, Smith assumed a moral authority in human beings that they would have what he called character, uh, something that would regulate the complete devotion to self-interest that frankly lives in all of us. He assumed that people would not, for instance, crash the stock market, plundering the hard-earned savings of millions in order to make themselves rich, because that would be morally wrong. I'm not sure the capitalism that he was formulating and the one that exists now are even distant cousins, perhaps not related at all. Now, Jesus... In answering this, frankly, kind of rude question asserted from the crowd as he is teaching along one line, and here's this interruption, this question about uh, family dysfunction and inheritance, a combination that is as common as peanut butter and jelly, he warns the crowd against greed. But not just greed, all kinds of greed. Did you hear that phrase? The Greek word uh, being translated as greed is pleonexia, and it has a rich heritage in Greek philosophy. I doubt it was used by the gospel writers unintentionally. It is defined as the insatiable desire to have what rightfully belongs to others, or even a desire for more than your share. 
And yet we know that there's this story that drives us. It drives all of us, which says that accumulation can rescue us. In fact, it can save us. And lest you think that I'm just aiming this judgment at Wall Street or the one percenters, we have our own investment in this story, fellowship. Thanks to the incredibly generous estate gifts of many people, Joe Unger chief among them, this church has a lot of resources. And we're struggling to decide what to do with them. In part, I think, because we wrestle with this story of how much is enough. Not just for today, but also for our future. How do we build these barns? Maybe we need to tear these ones down and build bigger ones. What is our share? I mean, that's a legit question for people trying to plan and maintain an institution, one that I would argue has a unique mission here in Tulsa. One that is very worthy of keeping alive. But isn't that what this guy is doing in the parable? I mean, isn't he just planning for his future, taking grain and storing it for the years to come so that he can take it easy? Or do the farmers in the crowd around Jesus know that his plan is folly in the first place? All that stored up grain will rot long before he can use it. So too, we have this adage, you can't take it with you. But that doesn't keep us from accumulating, does it? Often far more than we need. And then there's this. We often limit this spiritual instruction to economics. But I think that Jesus actually has much more in mind. In other places in Scripture, he teaches that giving and receiving have this deep relationship to each other. Give, and it shall be given to you, he says in Luke's version of the Beatitudes, as a way of saying that giving and receiving may very well be the same thing. That circle must be completed, or it's like pedaling a bicycle with one leg. I mean, you can move, but not very far and not very fast. So it's not just greed in the way that we think about it. That Jesus teaches this crowd it's all kinds of greed. Greed or unbalanced accumulation. It breaks our healthy cycles. It corrupts our relationships. When we give but never receive, we're breaking the needed cycle. When we get, get, get but never give... We are also building in unhealthy and unsustainable ways. Have you ever been a part of a relationship, any kind of relationship, where one person only took resources, emotions, time, but never gave? Did that last? Was it a good relationship? If you're thinking, no, I've never been a part of that, that person might be you. When we think that we're meant to have more love than someone else, or more respect, or more dignity, or more value, that's greed. When we believe that some people are useful and others are not, that's the sin of greed, the thing that pushes back against the order that God provides to us, forged in our inherent created value, our interconnectedness. Now, the word that appears most often in this certain rich man's speech is I, a pronoun referring to himself. What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and my goods No mention, do you notice, of his workers or his family? Not even a little gratitude for the gifts from God, the sun and the rain and the earth. He is a self-made man. A story we hear a lot in our version of capitalism. But the parable teaches 
that none of us accomplish what we accomplish, no matter what it is that we accomplish, alone. And more than that, we are, in fact, interdependent. Gareth Higgins, the co-author of this book, tells a story of an anthropologist who's studying a hunter-gatherer community, and she got to witness one of the major hunts of the year. And at the end of the hunt, the leader of the tribe was distributing the meat from the hunt to all of the villagers, the animal that he had hunted and killed. And this anthropologist was perturbed and confused by this because she wondered why he was sharing so generously. She thought that maybe he needs to learn about modern refrigeration techniques, right? So that he can keep all of this abundance for himself. He hunted it. It's his meat. And she tried to talk with him about this. And he didn't understand at all what she was referring to. The concept just didn't compute. Eventually, he said to her, Oh, I store my meat. I store my meat in the belly of my friends. In other words, there will come a time when I'm not successful in my hunt or when I just can't hunt anymore. But these people will take care of me partly because I took care of them. That's the dance of giving and receiving, the spiritual corrective to greed of all kinds, and the real connection that Jesus calls us to in his teaching. The truth is whether we're talking about the stories of domination, revolution, isolation, purification, victimization, or this story of accumulation, we're talking about stories that don't work. How do we know that they don't work? Well, because We've tried all of them, and we've lived all, some version of all of them, and we know they don't work, yet we still try them over and over and over, don't we? And as all of us can attest to here in these weeks after the new year, um, how are those resolutions going, y'all? <laughs> and in the days before we're at least supposed to give up something, for the season of Lent. Change isn't easy. It takes discipline. Ugh. We discipline ourselves for a diet or for an exercise program, for getting out of bed early on a cold morning like this one to meditate or to pray or to walk the dog. We discipline ourselves to stay on a budget, to keep a job we don't like, to maintain relationships with family members that we don't see eye to eye with at all. And discipline, after a while, starts to feel like a four-letter word, something you mumble under your breath as you begrudgingly get after the task. And it could sound like this whole sermon series is me asking you to discipline yourself off these six stories and on to a seventh. And I guess that's not wrong, but I hope there's more to it. Disciplines, you see, are exactly what the disciples have. There's a reason Jesus called them his disciples, because he knew that they'd have to practice to discipline a different way of being in the world. And they'd have to start listening to different stories. Not write new stories, not enact new stories, but start listening to them as the first act of a discipline that would carry them to something else. See, sometimes we get the cart before the horse and we forget that our stories, they give us images of what is possible. And if we only have stories of what already is, we have no vision for what could be. If we only have us over them, us versus them, us versus some of us, us in spite of them, us away from them, and us with more than them, then what do we know but the world that already exists? Is it any wonder why, in a world built on such stories, the only newness that arrives is new ways that we fight each other, or hide from each other, or ostracize each other? So how do we live? 
in times like these? How do we listen for that seventh story in times like these? What is our discipline in our 21st century context? Well, I'll be honest that I think I'm still figuring that out. But here's what I've got so far, helped by this book. First is to remember that it's always been times like these. These stories have been around a long time as long as we humans have been around. So in some very real ways, we're not trying to solve new problems. We're trying to solve very old problems. And we can learn from our ancestors, spiritual and otherwise, as we reach for a different story. And then I think we have to have and maintain a vision for this new world. As Rabbi Michael Lerner says, Dr. King is not known for a speech entitled, I have a complaint. (laughs) He spoke against the injustices of his time, what he called the evil triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism, but he also outlined a vision to overcome them. He enacted a practice for his own disciples the practice of nonviolence, which was far more than some intellectual exercise. It asked those who chose it to give of their time and their resources and their talent, even their bodies, as they received something for that. The well-worn but critical to us idea of hope. Hope with legs, hope with direction, hope that this new world, this beloved community, was indeed possible. And finally, there is, of course, uh, some reprogramming to be done, friends. After all, we are all bombarded with messages that tell us that violence is redemptive, that revenge is a solution, that isolation is sustainable, that purification is what God intends that victimization is our identity, and that accumulation isn't just an unsustainable, unsatiable beast. In fact, pay attention today. You'll get all of these stories sold to you in one way or another. Instead, if you're looking for a seventh story, You can listen to some political examples, like a Northern Ireland peace process, like the story of reconciliation in South Africa, like the civil rights movement here in the United States, or the workers' movements of Cesar Chavez and Dorothy Day. We can listen to literature like The Color Purple, or the poetry of Wendell Berry or Amanda Gorman. We can re-watch Ted Lasso, or Northern Exposure, Or see the power of personal narrative in the great PBS series, Finding Your Roots, that always has this transformative moment for the guests as they adjust their own narrative. Read Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit or Saving Paradise by Rita Nakashima Brock and Rebecca Ann Parker. Listen to Stevie Wonder's songs in the key of life or virtually anything from Yo-Yo Ma. Practice some meditation, or join the next Ignatian spiritual group with Ken Cox and learn to listen to an inner voice. All of these different stories, listened to deeply, are a seventh option. They teach us in diverse ways that the healing we seek, the true security and peace we long for, is found in embracing the reality that there is no them. There is only us. So the story that our kids are finishing across the way involves the arrival to the village of a horse. And the horse begins to whinny and neigh this new story to them all, telling them that they don't have to live by those solutions that they had come up with that weren't really solutions after all. 
This horse speaks in poetry. She speaks in parable. She speaks in these strange verses. She tells them this song. There is no big or small, no short or tall, no best or worst, no blessed or cursed, no dirty or clean, no cause to be mean, no rich or poor, no reason for war. We have more than enough in the story of love. Each is for all of us and all are for each of us. This is the wisdom this new story teaches us. She tells them that the seventh story is the story of love. May those who have ears listen. Amen. Welcome to our time of community prayer, everyone. I have a prayer request from Lee uh, that her husband, Tim, our companion, Tim Daniels, will be having shoulder surgery on February 28th. It's outpatient. So, Tim, we pray for you that that will be a good outcome. I'm happy to share that uh, Danielle... Uh, she is, Daniel Higdale, she is doing better because she had COVID, and so she's very thankful for that. And also, please continue to pray for uh, Robert, your mom, her hip surgery recovery. Yes, with that. Yes. And, of course, we have many companions that are, that are dealing with cancer and other illnesses. So please remember all of them in your hearts today. And I want to remind you that when you pray with or for somebody together, like we are now, you are giving of yourself because you can be an anchor for somebody who feels like they're alone. So please remember that. So if you feel comfortable, please go ahead and close your eyes and say aloud the name or in silence the names of the people and places that are on your hearts. God of abundance, for all the good things we have received, we say thank you. You encourage us to share freely what we have been given with those who are in need. For when we share with cheerful hearts, the joy that we receive from giving will be like coins of gold being poured into our hands, pressed down, shaken, filled to overflowing. So move us to share God Work through us to give not only of our money, but also our time and the talents that you have gifted us with, all the while trusting that you will provide for all of us, your children. We pray these things with Jesus, who taught us to give and who taught a prayer much like this one. Our creator, who is in heaven, Holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you reign in the power that is love, now and always, amen.
remember as we serve communion uh, this morning that we have a gluten-free option, and should you need that, just tell the servers as you come forward. All of the cups contain juice, not wine, and are reusable glass, so you just put them in the baskets as you head back to your seat, and we sterilize them after every service. These are all ways that we make sure everyone is welcome at this table and that we properly take care of our resources. Before we join in communion, let us sing together this hymn of preparation. who are hungry for a different story, for here we are fed. We are all fed. You are all welcome to this table. Will those who are assisting please come forward? just the season, folks, and we're trying to be extra careful. Here at the table, we remember this amazing story. It is part of the seventh story in which Jesus and his disciples, those who had been following him, they gathered at a table like this to share a meal one night. They had done that A thousand times before, only on this night, Jesus paused. He took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he shared it with them. He said, take and eat. This bread is like my physical life. It is given for you. After they had eaten, he took the cup, he blessed it, and he poured it out. And he said, take and drink. I'm in this cup. And as we drink this cup, we seal a new covenant of hope and peace and trust as if it were made in the essence of my life. And now, so many years later, every time that we eat this bread and we drink this cup, We do so in remembrance of him and we reseal that covenant all over again, ministering to you in his name. I give you this seventh story.
still have the note on my... Put your mic on. Yes. Friends, we give of ourselves our time, talent, and treasure to help enact the facets of the seventh story, both here in this place and beyond into our community. You can give to support this church either in the giving box in the back of the, congr- of the sanctuary or online at ucctulsa.org. Will you join me responsibly in this prayer of dedication? Gracious God, during the season of Epiphany, may our eyes and ears be open to a new reality, beginning with how we give of ourselves to the world beyond us. Help us to reach out to others as you, Holy One, have reached out to us. Amen. send us out into this, I'm going to say, beautiful day. (laughs) It has its own beauty. We certainly need the rain. Sending us forth uh, in hopes that um, a pop star's plane arrives in Las Vegas on time. (laughs) Please, Tay-Tay, get there. Uh, And for the rest of you, perhaps a sporting event of some sort, or just the food and commercials. Or just usher. (laughs) Friends, let us go forth from this place in peace. Pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another. Every single other. Amen.